Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for this uh, beautiful day this morning, and we thank you for your word. And we just pray now that you would make it alive to us. Lord, help us to, to see your love, your grace, and your mercy for us. Help us to apply that to our, our walk with you this coming week. Uh, we just pray that you would use Izzy as a vessel to speak through this morning. You would draw us closer to you. We ask that now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, well, good morning, guys. If you join me in turning in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, we're going to pick up that we were in 1 John a couple weeks back before the Palm Sunday and Easter celebrations that we've had. So back to 1 John chapter 2. Now, for those that ha haven't ever studied the book of 1 John, this is a, a short little epistle at the end of your Bible. It's not the Gospel of John, although it's the same writer who wrote the Gospel of John. It's... Uh, a bit later, though, in his life when he'll write this. he'll um, And later, after this, he'll be actually banished to the island of Patmos where he'll write the book, the last book we have in the Bible, the book of Revelation. But John is the disciple that, in, in the Gospels of John, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus, what? Loved. Loved. He, he would talk about himself and some are like why does this guy write third person about some guy the disciple whom jesus loved ran faster than peter and got to the tomb we just studied that last week remember and the, and and arrived first he was first just want to let everyone know i'm faster runner than peter but he didn't go in he stayed outside until peter got there and then peter slow and steady he went right on in examined the Colossal that the Lord wasn't there and then John got up the nerve and went in so there's interesting things that the 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 epistles tell us about this guy but but this thing that he says the disciple whom Jesus loved writes this when he's writing to folks about his faith it's interesting that he knew he was loved by the Lord now could all of us write the disciple whom Jesus loved says that, you know, we, we all could say that. But some people don't realize this, that, you know, there's, we have a living God. A God that has come and he reveals himself to each person. I find it interesting how he meets each of us where we're at. He knows where we're at, what we're going through. He knows how to show us the things that we need for our faith to strengthen us. And to, to in the Old Testament, he'll reveal himself as, to, well, Abraham will declare he's Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. Or he'll be Jehovah Tesitkanu, in Hebrew that's God our righteousness. Or Jehovah Rapha, the one that, that um, well, he's powerful and to be praised. There's, there's all these different revelations of the same God. He's the same God, but different assets. Uh, aspects, different facets. Like I, I like to liken it unto a diamond. You have this really precious diamond. It's just one diamond. But picture a diamond about this big. You know, if we had one of those, boy, it, well, I, I'd have my house paid for. I'd get rid of the diamond. But, but if you had a diamond, like I'm talking fist-sized diamond, and it was cut, you know, with all the little beautiful cuts that the jeweler makes that make that refractive you know, catch the light and make it spin out like little different, different um, prisms of the of the rainbow come out. That's what gives it all that. Sp you know, it takes the light and refracts it inside and off of each little facet. It's called of the diamond, and it gives you that sparkle and that and those different glints and 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 and, and brightness. And one person might look at the diamond from one side and say, "Oh, look at that beautiful hue that's coming off of it." And it's because behind it, maybe there's a beautiful blue, and it's refracting through it and they're like look at that gorgeous blue little tint to it and someone on the other side be going no i see pinks and purples and and isn't it interesting all these it's the same diamond but to the person that's beholding it from whatever perspective they look at it though as marvelous as it is, as it is wherever you stand and look at it it's like when we look at god we see different things and john John saw something that is really interesting. He saw that he was the disciple 
whom Jesus loved. He knew it firsthand. He, remember at the Last Supper, where was he seated at the, at the, at the Last Supper? You, you guys have seen the paintings of Petros. Yeah, he was the one leaning, it says, on Jesus' breast. He was that close to Jesus, right on his chest. Now, I don't know about you, but anyone would want to, if you're going to trade with any of the guys at the table, we get to go back for, for, for just a couple hours. Trade places with anybody at the table, and you can sit anywhere. Pick just We're going to trade out one disciple. You get to pop in for them. Would anybody besides me go for John's spot? I mean, of all the guys at the table, he's the one that was leaning on Jesus. And, you know, I... I, how, would, how would you like to be that close to the Lord that you're leaning on him and he knows he's about to die? I wonder if he leaned over to John and said, John, I love you. Because John's going to write some things this morning in his epistle, this first, this first epistle of John that bear out to me that he really did understand that God loved him and that God loves each of us. In fact, he seems to be one of the gospel writers that really bears out this truth. And I want to show you this morning how this love, it was brought into this world by Jesus. And John describes it in such, he has a wonderful way of, but let me show you this. In, in John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, we read this. We, we did the first two verses a couple weeks ago. If you want to listen to them on YouTube, they're, they're posted now. But we come to verse 3, and it says, By this we know that we have come to know him. This is one of those um, I, I mentioned a couple weeks ago. John is going to start to tell us how do we know the things what we know in our faith. You know, And I am sure John must have pastored for a while because he's going to hit all of the questions we get as pastors. How do I know if I am really know God? How, how do I know if I've come to know him? People ask that. You know, they want to know, is this really real? How do I know he's really there? How do I know these different things? And, and John is going to answer a bunch of them in this chapter. But this morning, I'm going to show you this first one. How do we know we've come to know God? He says the answer right here, if we keep his commandments. It says, the one who says, I've come to know him, and he does not keep his commandments, he, it says, he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. If you say you've come to know God, but you don't keep his commandments, sorry, I got news for you. You're lying. You have not come to know him. Verse 5 tells us, but whoever, but whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Now the one who says he abides in him, if you say I, I'm, I, I hang out with the Lord. Abide means to remain. I remain with Jesus. He's, he's with me. I'm with him. We're together all the time. If you claim to be a Christian and that you're really hanging out with the Lord, listen to what John says. He says, you ought to, you ought to walk in the same manner as Jesus walked. You say that you're a Christian, John says, then you need to walk the walk. You can't just talk the talk. There's too many Christians in, especially, I hate to say it, but in Western Christianity, we have a lot of people that the Bible says pay lip service to God, but not heart service. Heart service leads you to putting your feet into the footsteps where, where do you, where do you want me to step, Lord? And Jesus said, I only do the things I see the Father do. I only say the things what I hear the Father saying. W wouldn't that be nice if we could do that? We only, how many times would I keep myself from getting in trouble? If I would just do the things what Jesus did. This is John says, if you say you abide in Christ, then you need to walk like Jesus walked. You need to imitate him. Paul said that. Be an imitator of Christ. Well, actually he said, be an imitator of what? Of me as I'm an imitator of Christ. Boy, talk about some shoes to fill. By the way, if you want to grow in your faith, just turn to someone and say, just imitate me as I imitate Christ. You want to you wanna really see how good your faith is doing? Pick someone close to you and say, just copy me. Everything I do, you can, 
You can, I will set the example. I will follow Christ and you can just follow in my footsteps. How many of you would do that? It's a really, by the way, it's a great spiritual check to find out if you're not doing something right. Because if you have some area of your life that you're participating in a sin and you're thinking, well, I want you to imitate me when I'm good on Sunday morning at church. And I want to, you know, you can imitate me when I go to Bible study on, you know, the midweek service. But, but the rest of the week, you might, especially late at night when I'm at home and no one's around and I, you know, I have some bad habits and you, you sh shouldn't imitate. No, I'm talking 24-7. Be an imitator of me, Paul said, as I am of Christ. He was willing to walk the walk. And John, not only did Paul teach this, John taught it. He said, if you say you abide in Christ, then you need to walk in the same manner that he walked. Walk the walk. Quit talking just the talk, but walk it. Show people. Now, he says in verse 7, beloved, I am writing to you, he says, not a new commandment, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. And the old commandment is this, the word which you have heard. On the other hand, though, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in, and in you because darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now, the one who says that he is in the light and yet he hates his brother, well, he is in darkness until now. It says, and the one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness, and he walks in darkness, and he does not know where he's going because the darkness has done what? Has blinded his eyes. This is one of the things that John is really good at declaring in his, these, the first, second, and third John, all these three little epistles, tell us, emphatically that God is light how much darkness is in him the scripture says there is no darkness in God none and John says beloved I'm writing to you a new command kind of which is an old command but it's like new and why would he say that by the way do you know what was what was the old when Jesus was tested by that that lawyer came and said what's the greatest command of the law and what was his answer Jesus Quotes from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And then he said, and the second is like unto the first. Love your neighbor. You guys know this one. Some people call this the golden rule. Love your neighbor. as but, but see, Jesus didn't just say love your neighbor as yourself was the, was the fulfillment of the law. He said first love the Lord. Your God, with all of your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then he said, the second command is like unto, we don't use this word likened. Anyone use that in a sentence lately? Yeah, I used that yesterday. Likened. It's kind of like likened unto this or that. Or, sure. Only preachers use these words. I have to like put it in modern. It's like unto the first commandment. So the second Part of this is love your neighbor as yourself. But it's like unto the first command, which is how am I, what parts of me am I supposed to love God with? All my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength. How am I supposed to love my neighbor? Like unto the first, right? So that means all my heart, all my mind, all my... See, some people say, Pastor... I love them with my mind, you know, but you don't really want me to get my strength. There. You, mean, you mean you want me to get up and go help them? That's going to involve my body and, and you know, I'm going to have to, oh, man. Can't I just love them mentally from afar? They're not really that fun to be around, you know. I just, and I said, no, it says like unto the first. And the first is love God with all of your being. This covers all the dimensions of you, you know, heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's, the, that's your whole being, love God. But he says, lo love your neighbor as yourself. And interestingly, if you turn to John's gospel, chapter 13, we'll, we'll just turn there with me real quick. John 13, and go to verse 34. In John's gospel, 
Now, this is the, the longer version. This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John. Keep your, you can keep a finger in 1 John. We'll come back to it. But in John 13, verse 34, it says, A new commandment, he says, I give to you, that you what? Love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, how did Jesus love us? Just mentally, right? He just said, I love you from afar. I don't really want to get close to you. You got cooties. I don't want to touch you. Ukus, yeah. Get away. No. He loved us with all his heart, all his mind, all his soul, and all his strength. He let his body be broken, beaten, bruised for us. Right? He, he showed, I love you. And, and he said, no, no greater love has has a man than this that you lay down your what your life for your friends and then he turned to them and said and you you are my friends he was telling them i'm going to lay down my life for you now verse 35 of, of john 13 says by this by what that you love one another by this love it says all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another you want to show people that you're really a follower of jesus you need to have love you have to let that love come out for one another and our society is getting weird about you know just saying to a person we love you in the love of the lord you know just tell someone that you love them by the way we have a whole generation that is being kind of mind twisted by the um the world that the love that is being portrayed in the in the movies and in the media it's not this love this pure love of god which is a, an unconditional love this is i love you i love you right where you're at now true love loves a person and accepts them right where they are but it loves them so much it doesn't say Oh, you're, maybe you find someone and they're and they're tra they're trapped. They're in a they're in a rut. They're in a hole. It, you say I love them, but they're 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 really down. They got a tree laying on them. Love you, brother. See you later. That's not true true love. You see your brother in, in in a in a problem. What do you do? You go help him. True love loves so much that it cares about the person like, like you would care about your own self. What would you want someone to do for you if a tree had fallen on you? You'd want them to come and lift that thing, get me out of here. True love does that for that brother. You love them as you would love yourself. And Jesus says, when you love with that kind of love, all men know that you're his disciple. That proves that we really follow the Lord, that we have love. But John, when he writes 1 John, he said, if a brother hates somebody, he says he's not really walking in the light. He's walking in what? Darkness. Darkness has blinded his eyes. Hate is a very blinding thing. Hate has this ability to make us behave very improperly towards others. And John says it right here. The one who hates, is, he, it says, uh, who sa I'm sorry, verse, this is back to 1 John 2, 9. The one who says he's in the light, yet he hates his brother. John says he's in darkness until now. He actually isn't able to see clearly. And some of you may wonder this, and, and I know John had had some experience with pastoring people. I'm very, very sure of it after my only but brief 30 plus years of being a pastor, I have, I have, I, and maybe some of you, have any of you run into a person who says they're a Christian, but they seem to be like spiritually blind or in the dark? And you're wondering, what is up, man? It's like they can't see anything. You talk to them about things of the Lord, they don't, I don't see that. You talk to them about, a scripture that just beautifully spoke to your heart or that I don't see that. You're like, how can you just not see any of this? You know, I mean, it's like you're blind. And I've come to understand that what John is saying here is very powerful. He's saying, if you have hate in your heart, 
It's like sitting in the dark. I used the analogy to the kids last night. I ran this by them at the college and career group. I said, I'm going to give you guys the Reader's Digest of tomorrow's sermon. Here's the main point. If you walk in the light, you can see stuff, right? If you walk s spiritually in the light, his light. But there are people who don't want to walk in his light. They walk instead in the dark, in hatred, in unforgiveness. And it was handy because right next to me in my easy chair where I was teaching the kids was my remote. I have a couple remotes. I hate that I have this, you know, the one that goes to the Blu-ray, one that goes to the TV, one that, you know. And the one that goes to the Blu-ray is the smallest of my remotes, and it's all black. And it has this propensity to, when, when, the, when all the lights are all in the, in the room and it's just the, the light from the television, and I want to change something using the Blu-ray zapper, I go, where did it go? That little bugger, it just, it, it like, it hides. It, it like migrates into little cracks in the chair or, or down or falls down. And when the room is dark and you're looking for something that's black, you know how easy it is to spot? It doesn't work. You're like, where is, and finally, you know, and of course, when I'm comfortable in the chair, I don't want to get up to turn on the light. But so many times I have groped around trying to find the thing. I can't find it anywhere. And I finally get up, turn on the light, and I look back. And darn it, that thing was where? Right next to my cheeks. Right there. That far away. And you think, how could you have missed it? It was right next to you. I'm sorry if I'm not supposed to say that in church, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying? When, when you're in dark... The, the thing what you're looking for, the thing that, it, it, it could be the thing you need, could be right next to you, and you don't see it. And by the way, this is a spiritual truth. When people, when people are walking in hatred and unforgiveness, it's like they're spiritually, someone turned the lights out in the room. They got a little light. Yeah, I see there's a little light from the TV. I, but I can't see, I can't find the remote. I can't find, I can't find a verse to help me. Pastor, you say God shows you all these things from, from his scripture all the time. Well, how do you see that? And, and if I point it out to them, it's like pointing out, the, it's right there, there's a remote. They're like, oh, I see it now. Like when you point it out to them, they see it because you pointed it out. It's like you shined a spotlight on it. But they look at you like, how did you see that? And you know how we see it? We let go of hatred. We let go of unforgiveness. We let go. The Bible says, see to it that no even a root of bitterness springs up amongst you. Because what happens when a little root of bitterness springs up? It says, by it, how many are defiled? Many. When people get bitter, oh, it's, it's, it's got a bad contagion. It just spreads. One person's bitterness, they start telling other people, man, 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 I don't like that. I don't like this. About those guys. I don't like that. And pretty soon the bitterness just spreads. And it defiles many people. The Bible says, see to it that that doesn't spring up among you. That little root. And <laughs> I remember this brother, dear Richard, uh, he, 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 he um, was at men's prayer one day and he was telling us, guys, I have sinned. We're like, what? He said, uh, on the side of my house, there's a little strip about, thir it was about three feet wide, I guess, down the fence line of his whole length of his house. He said, a couple weeks back, I, 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 I had looked down the side of the house, and I had noticed the weeds. There was a couple little weeds like this. Now, we're in Hawaii. So for those of you not from Hawaii, just to let you know, he lives up Mauka, which is up on the mountain, regular rain every day, and regular rain... And, and, and weeds in Hawaii in a perfect climate, what does it produce? Growth. And he came to men's prayer and says, guys, I, f I should have gone out there. I had this feeling like I should go pull those weeds when they're small, when it's easy. But I left them. And now, there is a, it, tall as this little guy. The weeds were up to his waist, he said, in, in just three, three weeks' time, just had taken over the whole thing. And he, he said it took 
It took not what what would have been just a, an hour or so of pulling a weed here and there. He said took an entire day. And it was like mowing down Cambodia or something, you know. He just he said it was just horrific and the amount of damage he said it did to the soil because you know, you get a weed this tall on the top side, but well, how much roots does it have on the bottom? And so he'd pull on that thing and out would come a clump, you know, big old clump this big hanging on and all his dirt, which is so precious here in Hawaii, he's like shaking the roots, come on. He said it took forever to get all those weeds out of there. And he said, God spoke to him right then. He said, you remember that verse? About see to it that if there's a root of bitterness that you take it out before it defiles many, before it spreads. Here's a physical example of what happens when you let the weed grow. And how much work extra is it to get rid of it now than if you would have just got rid of it when it was little. You would have plucked that thing out and said, you know what, I ain't going to let that hang in my heart. Bitterness does not do you any good. Even a little smidge of it has a really powerful effect, especially if given a little time and a little water. And that thing will spring up, and then it will not only defile the garden of your heart, it will defile the people around you. And John, the guy who understood God had revealed to him, he was loved by Jesus. The disciple whom Jesus loved, he wants to write to us, guys, I was there. I beheld him. I touched him. I heard him. My eyes saw this Lord. And I'm telling you, he came. He's the Now, we're going to go on in, the, in this epistle. We'll see. He's going to say God is light. But in his light, there is no darkness. And if we want to say we walk with him, we're abiding in him, then we got to walk in his light. And in his light, guys, we can't say, yeah, I hate that guy, but I'm, I'm walking with the Lord. You know, I'm totally in the light. No, you, you just dimmed, you grabbed the dimmer switch and turned it to halfway dark. And then if you hate a little more another person, it's like you just grabbed it and turned it a little darker. And pretty soon you'll be going to me, Pastor, I don't see those verses that you see till you point them out. To the people who walk in the light, they're coming and calling me going, hey, let me show you this verse I saw. I'm like, good. That's nice. Nice to have other guys walking in the light. Because John's going to point out, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, it says, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us continually of how much sin? All sin. And there's one other neat little side note he puts. And, and it says, and we will have fellowship one with another when we walk in that light man he's cleansing us and and it's our sin that bl mucks up our our fellowship you know if if but if jesus is washing me of my sin and washing you of your sin then that thing that separates us is not there and we feel this instant koinonia with people we didn't even meet we just you know just you can meet a brother or sister from halfway around the world and you know they're in the Lord. When you're walking in the light and they're walking in the light, there's just this sweet, instant connection. Because sin is not doing that work of separate. You know, this almost wrote, it's my sin what has separated me from thee, O God. He felt the, the power of sin to separate. And it not only separates us from God, that vertical relationship we were supposed to have first, but what does it also separate us from? others each other love god first and love your neighbor as yourself it will it'll mess up your relationships with others down here on this horizontal i go, i tell the kids first we got to get our our vertical orientation set up right we have to have us and god in the right plane then when that relationship's solid we're able to do us and everything down here on the horizontal plane all the other relationships we have down here but if you want to walk in hatred you want to walk in bitterness you want to walk in unforgiveness it's like spiritually and by the way some of you are going to identify you're going to know people that you know are spiritually in the dark 
And I'm just giving you a clue as to what might be bringing the dark dimmers on. Their own hatred could be the thing that is keeping them from seeing those truths. That, that Though they be right next to them, they don't see it. Now the reason I point this out is because John said he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, you guys know it says, for God so loved the world. John 3.16, the same guy wrote this, by the way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, what? Believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Same guy that wrote this wrote that verse. He knew God loved the world. When I heard, I grew up hearing that verse. I'm a good Catholic boy growing up. Went to catechism, studied to be an altar boy. Do you know that we learned John 3.16 in catechism? Learned it. But in my understanding, God so loved the world meant God so loved all the good people. Now, I don't know why I thought this. Well, I can tell you why now that I look back. But at the time, I just thought Jesus came to die for the good people, the goody two-shoes, one of which I was not. And I knew that I'm not going to get to go because he only loved those people. But is that really true in the Scripture? Is that, in the, is that the real shine the light on the verse? That's what it means? God only loves the good people? No, the Bible says at the right time, while we were yet sinners, Christ died, the just for the unjust. He died for us when we would. And how many of us are righteous? How, much, how many in God's sight are, the, are truly the goody two-shoes in his sight? None. none. There is none righteous, no, not even one. Wow, I had it messed up. But see, I can tell you why I had it messed up after reading this. Because here it says the one who hates his brother is in darkness until now. And I can tell you without any, not to boast, but hate was definitely part of my wiring. And there were different people I hated for different reasons. Some that had disappointed me, some that had hurt me. And being raised in a Sicilian family, we had a little schooling on how to remember you know, someone hurts you. And even if they say, oh, forgive me, we go, we'll forgive you, but we'll, we won't what? We won't ever forget it. And then we would make notes, you know, that day you did this to me. And, and we, we, like, keep a journal. Whether we write it physically, we got it up here. I, I remember, I've shared this before, but, but I had an aunt. We went all the way back east for, to Detroit, Michigan for the – the families were coming together with a big wedding. It's a, and weddings in a good as Sicilian wedding is like a week long, okay? And the food comes and goes and comes and I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's continual dancing and just, it was the best feast I've ever had. I look back, I think, as a kid, one whole wall of this hall that we had was all desserts. <laughs> Homemade Italian desserts, you know, gnocchi and 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 spinji, yeah, oh, everything all made casa de we were like oh my gosh this is my mouth is why i shouldn't talk about this it's right before ch lunch but then another whole wall the long wall was all the main dishes just a whole entire wall of just food and and the food just kept coming kept coming and and the and the dancing went on and it literally lasted for an entire week the celebration people came they went home they rested they came back the party was 24 hours a day for seven days. And it came time for the actual wedding cake when it was to come, you know, to the hall for the thing. And they were carrying it, and it started to tip. And one of the, uh, one of the ones put their hand like this, and they caught the cake from falling, from going down to the floor, and they saved it. But my whole life growing up, I always heard the story of, how dare that they put their hand in the cake. <laughs> and I was there. I was thinking, that was a great save. You know, as a kid, that was a good save. But you know what? The person's point of view was different than what a good save. Their point was, you stuck your hand in the cake before it was time for them to cut the cake. And so it had a mark in the cake. And how dare you ruin the cake. And we're never going to forgive you. We're never going to forget. And, then they, and the person who did it was like, forgive me. We'll think about it. 
So my Sicilian ingraining was very good at not really forgiving. And I didn't realize that this, this not forgiving thing, this holding on to things, what people do to you and, and remembering, this causes you to become spiritually, what, in the light? No. In the dark. And so I can say to you, just like John said, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. When people say, how do you know God's real? I say, because to me, I'm the, I'm the disciple whom Jesus took from a heart that was filled with hate and anger and unforgiveness, and he replaced it. He took away that hatred. He took away that, that anger and that, that unforgiveness, and he replaced it with his love. His grace. And he showed me great grace. And because of that, I can say, you know, something like, that person is terrible. They'll, they don't even deserve to be in the kingdom. I'm thinking, they're a lot better than I was. They're further along. If God could save me, some of you are like, you're so good at dealing with people that are messed up. They never seem to shake, my wife's like, they never shake him. Hmm. I wonder why. Because I look at the grace that God poured out to me and think, if he had grace to me, and, and they're not as messed up as I was, then will he have grace to them? Sure. And I can tell you, the disciple, instead of who Jesus loved, like John declared, you see, each of us receive different things from the Lord to realize how real he is. To me, I know he's real because he took me from this f young boy filled with hate that was really angry and, and, and would fight at a, for no reason at all. I didn't need a reason. Just give me an excuse. Love to fight. Physically get in fights. That was fun. Breaking bones. I liked the snapping sound. I was, I was whacked. And I look back and think, if somebody snuck up behind me, because I was telling the kids last night, when, when, you, when you do fight, if you beat up somebody, there's a problem with doing that. Because once you beat up one person, you know, you might have beat that person, but they probably have a brother or a couple cousins or uncles or friends. And, and what started off with you just fighting one guy can turn into you fighting a bunch of guys the next day. And even if you win the next fight and you beat a bunch of guys, guess what? They go, we'll get more. And you have to learn either to align yourself with other guys that are good fighters so that you can walk around. And, 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 but you don't walk around like normal people. When you, when you get into this rut of fighting and you have made enemies, every little sound behind you, you're on full alert. Little twig snaps, you're ready to spin around and punch. And th there's a problem with that. Do you know what that does for your blood pressure? For, for your stomach? Your, 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 you get ulcers, you know? We say in Italian, agita. You get, you get, because you don't, you, someone comes behind, what do you want? And, and the bad thing was, my hand, just as I would turn, I don't know if you noticed what it did, but when I get ready to see what they want behind me, my hand already goes like this, because it's ready to punch. That's not love. That's paranoia. That's messed up. But the God who revealed to John that he sent Jesus and Jesus said, John, I love you. And John went, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. He could declare unequivocally to everybody, hey, guys, there is a God that loves you. He loves the whole world. And if you just believe in him, you won't perish. You'll have everlasting life. But if you walk in hate, you're walking in dark. And he doesn't want you to walk in dark. And I can tell you from a guy who walked in plenty of dark. There's a God that loves us and says, I'll, I'll trade you all that anger and that hatred for something that I want to give you. And you know what Jesus gave me instead of that? It's found in the... In, in John's gospel also, John 14 says, 
My peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives. He said, it's his peace. Doesn't mean you won't have conflict. It means he'll be with you in those conflicts. And all of a sudden I realized, Jesus wants to be with me. Walking with me. I'm not walking through this life alone anymore. And I don't have to worry if I hear, I mean, to, to me, to someone says, prove there's a God. I didn't spin around and punch that guy when he snuck up behind me. Just the other day, someone came up behind me, got really close, and I thought, wow, I didn't even turn to punch him. I went, hey, how you doing? That's, that's a big step. If, you, if you're coming from where I'm coming, that's like, there's a God. And he has changed the hate and replaced it with his love. He has changed the unforgiveness that I had and replaced it with his forgiveness. He said, how much have I forgiven you? I went, everything. How much should you forgive those guys? Is that a trick question, Lord? How much should I forgive? All things. And if you don't forgive, if you carry that unforgiveness, that person hurt you? You do like my aunt. I remember when the cake, when and that hand print and all. Oh, 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 oh. I was thinking, wait a minute. That was when I was like this high. It's like. What was that, 30 plus years ago? They hang on to things for so long. How long can one hurt keep you in the dark? So you may not realize that you may have been in the dark so long that you're wondering, wow, what's the light look like? But I'm here to tell you today, if you can receive this, you do yourself no good to hang on to unforgiveness, to hang on to hatred, to hang on to hurts, when somebody does you wrong, it would be behooving of you to just let it go. It, it, it would be the best thing you could, if you could hear this, if you can receive this, the best thing you could do is just let it go. If somebody hurts, I've used this analogy before, but some of you, somebody hurt you, they threw a rock at you. And what'd you do? You went and picked up that rock, you said, oh, you, you hurt me with this rock. I don't see good. We cleaned all the rocks off, so I don't have anything to work with here. Like, let me go over here. All right. I got a good one. It's hiding under the branch. You threw this rock at me, and it really hurt me. What's today's date? April 3rd, 2016. I'm right that on there. Johnny threw this at me. Never forget it. It was a really hard throw. It hit me right in the head. I ain't going to ever forget that you hurt me with this rock. But in order for me to hang on to this memory, I do something really strange spiritually. I go like this. Let me get this burlap sack here. You guys know what burlap is? We use it on the farm. It's that real scratchy kind of tan-colored fabric that's like woven. It, it's a coffee bag. Like, you know, and has, have any of you ever, say, growing up in Arizona on a farm, if you p pick up a, a burlap sack full of beans or whatever, and it's, um, and it's, 120 degrees out in the summer and you put that over your shoulder and your shoulder and your back starts to sweat under it and that fabric who invented that <laughs> the the devil himself i'm sure invented burlap because that stuff though it'd be strong it's like it's horrible on your skin man it just like it's so in, it, it's irritating scratches you and cuts you and if your person says, you hurt me, I'm going to remember that. Here's what you did spiritually. You took that rock, you grabbed yourself your own burlap sack, you wrote on it. This is Izzy's sack of remembrance. Take rock, insert in sack, throw over shoulder, and now I'm going to play Santa Claus. And I'm going to carry this with me because I'm going to keep it with me in case that maybe tomorrow or, or maybe, maybe next day, maybe a year from now, I'll be able to whip it out and remember Remember when you did this and taking my, oh, here it is. You threw this at me. Now, what's the problem with carrying this? And if you're a person that's carrying all of the things what people have hurt you with, maybe they threw a log at you or chainsaw that was running or <laughs> whatever thing they did to you that hurt you, you start grabbing it and throwing it into that sack, and now you're carrying the sack. And that sack gets heavier and heavier, and pretty soon 
You can't pick it up. And you're wondering, people are going, what's the matter with you, brother? Nothing, man, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm just fine here. And your shoulder's like, oh, man, my shoulder really hurts. By the way, it's interesting that a lot of pains come to people who carry unforgiveness. Though you say unforgiveness doesn't have any weight, I suggest you, it weighs more than this rock. It weighs more than a whole sack of rocks or a bunch of bricks and throw in some logs and whatever, steel beams, anything you want to throw in. Whatever somebody's hurt you with, you put the heaviest things there because it's terrible for your body. Now the kids, last night I told them there was a young man in our, in our high school and back then it was socially accepted to say he was retarded. We, they have a different term today. What was it? Mentally, special need, de developmentally delayed. Okay. I'm going to be politically correct. But I'm going to let you know that when I was in school, I was an accelerated student. And this boy, he was, he was our age physically, but they said he was about a sec second grader mentally. And he was still out in our high school, although he was the brunt of almost all of the kids picking on and, and they're joking and everything. And one day I passed by him and, and the kids were picking on him. And they were laughing at him. And you know what he did? He started laughing with them. He didn't understand they were laughing at him and it was him that they were mocking. He just thought, oh, they're laughing. Okay, it's time to laugh. So he started laughing. And I walked away thinking, I was a brand new Christian. God, that guy... He doesn't even have the mental capacity to understand they're laughing at him. And he just started laughing with him. Now I get on the bus and he gets on the bus right behind me and then sits in front of me. And I look over him and I someone said to him, how's your day going, Tommy? He said, oh, it's going great. And he's still laughing. And God just pricked my heart and says, so is it better to be so smart or so forgiving? Does he have a sack of unforgiveness that he's carrying like you? And I was like, dang, that guy is so happy. I en I'm envious. I was truly envious. He went home at the end of that day, even though people had picked on him, and he just laughed with them. And he, when they asked him, how was your day? He's like, oh, it's a great day. Just a great day. And I thought, saying you're smart is not so, if, you, if you're hanging on to for unforgiveness with your brains you're not so smart he was smarter and he was freer and so i can stand before you today and say the disciple whom jesus freed from a lot of hatred and a lot of hurts and a lot of unforgiveness and said let it go the disciple whom jesus said i don't even want you to keep the sack he, first he made me empty the sack rock by rock stick by stick hurt by hurt let it go. Till I had an empty sack. He goes, what you doing with that? I'm just hanging on to it in case I need it. <laughs> right? Just me and God having a conversation. Why are you carrying that burlap sack for? Well, it's my unforgiveness sack, Lord. It's empty now. Aren't you proud of me? It's empty. Yeah, I'm proud of you, but what are you carrying it for? You like burlap? You make a, you know, a little cloak out of it or something? I'm like, no, I hate burlap. Well, why are you carrying this? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Sometimes spiritually, we don't realize how stupid we are. And I'm using myself as the example of pure stupid here. Because I was actually spiritually holding on to the sack. Oh, yeah, Lord, I let it go. I let it all go. It's empty. What am I supposed to do with the sack then? This is where you become free. When you take that. Let me just ask it in a simple way. Do you think that that young boy at my high school that was mentally challenged, did he have one of them sacks? No. Never did, and he was full of joy and, and contentment and happiness, and I'm thinking, you know, some of you Christians need to throw away your sack. Maybe you got, and you probably have a lot less rocks and stuff in yours than I did. But it doesn't matter if you have just one. And you carry just one rock one hurt, will it defile you? 
Will it, whether you realize it or not, John says it will put you in the dark. And you could be sitting there, God, I need to know what you have. God, I just, I need to know what you want me to do. I don't even know how to operate the TV. It's over there. I can't make it work. I can't find the remote. And spiritually, you're in the dark and he's going, let it go. Because when you let it go, spiritually, the light comes on. And when that light's on, you go, there's the remote. <laughs> Little guy was trying to hide on me, huh? Easy to spot the things you need when you walk in the light. Difficult for the guys who do not. When they walk in sin and they call me up going, I just don't see like you see. I want to say to them, what sin are you holding on to? Let it go. That's how you get in the light. That's all I got for you today. Next week we're going to pick up with some of the things that, the reasons why John wrote this letter. Now he's writing this so we could know the first reason we just covered, that we could know that we know God. If we keep his commandments, that's how you know that you really have come to know him. If you're not keeping his commandments, there's your clue whether you've come to know him or not. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for these things that you have placed in the scripture to speak to us, Lord, to give us instruction for our faith. I pray this morning, if anyone here or anyone who listens later, Lord, the ones who are listening on the internet or on the, on, on the radio, Lord, we pray for all of the ones that will hear this, that they would be able to let go of any hatred, any bitterness, any hurt. They would let go of that burlap sack and all of the debris inside. They'd be freed from that. That they could come into your fullness of light. And that they could see the things the way you want them to see, Lord. Help us all in these areas. Please, Lord, help us. We pray in, in, in your son, in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said, amen. amen. Would you stand with me listening to a closing song? Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.